To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangshan Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants. Yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three, proverbially, large elephants in the room. When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones protecting inner megaliths, clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on, suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion, which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. The Orion Theory 
The coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavall and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and to us, a mystery, which is incredibly compelling. How can one still claim the pyramids to have been tombs when they are aware of the astounding burial chambers found within the Valley of the Kings? With the tomb of the sons of Ramses II being not only the largest, but what many archaeologists believe, second to the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx, is the next greatest discovery ever made within ancient Egypt. A literal labyrinth of chambers, it was initially discovered in 1825, yet due to its gargantuan scale, it wasn't until 1995, and thanks to an Egyptologist known as Kent R. Weeks, that we have begun to re-establish its true possible size. The tomb was examined several times, even being investigated by Howard Carter himself, yet due to the outer tombs having been looted in antiquity. He simply used them as a dumping ground for rubble. It was not until 1995, during the Theban mapping project, when Weeks decided to clear the outer tombs. Approximately 70 rooms lined along long corridors, running far back into the hillside were found. The number of rooms were then said to correspond to the number of sons the pharaoh sired. However, further excavations have revealed that the tomb is even larger, the size of an underground town cut directly from a granite hillside, its true scale still unknown. As of 2006, at least 130 chambers have so far been discovered, yet work continues on clearing the rest of this underground maze. We feel that although a later civilization, one lacking the knowledge to build such monuments, came along and claimed these relics as their own, with the possible motivation of an illusion of power, like that of the many other sites we cover worldwide, predictably, now also conveniently tied to these groups in academia. Yet the true feat these chambers would have been, along with the riches these pharaohs often left behind, are not only proof that these creations and collections of wealth were not only far beyond the ability of copper-wielding academically claimed builders, but that the archaeological evidence does indeed support the theory that these kings either ruled during the creator's civilization or built these monuments themselves. Yet how remains an infuriating enigma. We also feel their age, and indeed original lineage in the true history of the Giza Plateau, is what ultimately becomes convoluted. Yet I digress. Who built KV-5? It is a place we find highly compelling. Many of you have seen the recent viral video of a paraglider flying dangerously close to the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza with his GoPro with some astute people noting that this footage snapped hieroglyphics on the very top of the pyramid. Although many believe these sites be littered with hieroglyphs, the mainstream paradigm would have you believe that this is, in fact, a fallacy. There are no tombs, mummies, or indeed hieroglyphs to be found anywhere upon or inside the Great Pyramids. The question then is, what is this writing? Is it true hieroglyphs? And if so, what do they say? We do not condone the climbing or indeed vandalism or decisions to climb and possibly damage these astonishing and priceless relics. Yet the question remains, are these authentic? If so, why cover them up? Well, we may be able to explain why these hieroglyphs could indeed be covered up, 
and in addition, also back up the hypothesis that the Egyptians did not build the pyramids, but rather merely re-inhabited these astonishing ruins, adapting lost technologies discovered and unraveled within. Subsequently, using the pyramids to impress and intimidate their neighbors and convince the world they built them, not only then, but all the way into the modern era. Yet I digress. Along with this photograph of hieroglyphs corroborating the aforementioned hypothesis, we also have the array of photographs displaying casing stones, some detached, possibly due to past cataclysm, protecting stones often many hundreds of tons in weight that are clearly of a far greater age than that of what we feel are more modern yet still ancient conservation efforts we feel later undertaken on the pyramids themselves. Furthermore, in addition to the water controversy theory, which presents the evidence for Anubis Lake around what is now the Great Sphinx, the face of the Sphinx itself displays significant rain damage. Yet we feel the most compelling and supporting evidence for the pyramid's true age is the layers of salt sediment that were removed from lower chambers all over Giza during its re-excavation. This suggestive submersion would explain not only the extreme corrosion present on an older surface-level stonework, but the abrupt end of this very ancient civilization, who, we posit, were responsible for not only the Great Pyramids, but ruins all over the Earth. How could we have varying levels of casing stones, each of a different stone, and some even of a polygonal nature, yet the stone behind be far greater eroded? How could there be hieroglyphs beneath where there would have been a capstone, if these relics were not in the condition we see them today when re-inhabited? We find such questions, and indeed the hieroglyphs themselves, highly compelling. Although many of our viewers express a belief that all ancient ruins were constructed by our ancestors with methods learned over eons of trial and error, some also devoutly attest to them eventually succumbing to a biblically documented deluge. The fact remains, at this current time in history, we cannot prove this beyond doubt. As a collaboration who actively researches and seeks out these specific ruins in question, we have come into contact with considerable evidence to support many of these ruins having once been submerged either by fresh or, more often than not, an ancient sea. However, due to their possible extraordinary antiquity, these subversive experiences may have been merely due to climactic changes, rather than divine intervention. There is also growing hostility towards the once popularly touted proposition of ancient aliens, or perhaps ancient astronauts. Many governmental bodies have supposedly come clean over recent years regarding alien disclosure, releasing a number of apparent smoking guns to the public, often videos which included military testimonies regarding said encounters. Is it therefore such an absurdity to merely postulate that, based on currently presented information, that an alien civilization, clearly far more advanced than us, is currently observing our planet and species? Perhaps we once knew these beings, before something clearly happened within our past, something which made us forget a considerable amount of our own history. Many of the ancient structures found upon our planet defy belief or explanation. Is it so unforgivable to ponder whether our ancestors received an intellectual nudge at some point within antiquity? There are also many ancient tribes whose ancestral accounts often include some sort of visitation, with some, like the Dogons, celebrating the processions of the Sirius star system, processions we didn't confirm as accurate until earlier this century. And the Scythians could be seen as the most valuable of these tribes, mainly due to a mysterious idol once found frozen within one of their ancient tombs, sunk deep into permafrost among the Altai Mountains of Serbia. It is known as the Scythian Spaceman, and for good reason, it must be remembered when looking upon such objects with eyes from a modern world that the clothing this idol wears is far removed from the tribe in which created it. It is not only unusual, 
but eerily reminiscent of our own modern spacesuits. What's more, and perhaps the most damning evidence, is his space helmet, a device that would have been crucial for communication with a being from an entirely different atmosphere. What was the Scythian spaceman? What does it represent? Did the Eurasian nomads actually encounter an ancient astronaut? We find the existence of such artifacts highly compelling. We often cover the as yet unexplained features that can be found within the construction of many of the ancient ruins all over the world. These seemingly impossible feats of ancient architecture, seen by all, yet perceived by an academia that would like you to believe they were completed a mere few thousand years ago. Yet any explanation as to how these tasks were indeed undertaken or completed remain absent. We strongly suspect that a vast portion of Earth's and indeed our own human history is being covered up, simply because those who wish to sell you the answers do not have them. It is far more profitable for those in the so-called know to be perceived as indeed all-knowing, rather than to admit the patent fact they simply cannot explain these ancient structures. They do not know who built them, and most important of all, no idea when they were built. Countless museum artifacts also that, according to these same individuals, regardless of the obvious precision contained within, were created by individuals far less capable than we are today. Often absent or attached to illogical explanations as to their manufacture, these artifacts continue to be attributed to civilizations whose most advanced carving technologies were copper and stone chisels. We feel that many of these ancient artifacts, along with many impossible ancient megaliths, found perfectly placed within ancient ruins all over the world, are strong evidential factors to suggest that an ancient civilization once had at their disposal highly advanced precision machinery. One of the many interesting, perplexing ancient features are the ancient star holes, which have been discovered at a number of different ancient sites around the planet. Although places like Puma Punku or Giza's basalt plain possess precision drill holes, diving many feet into incredibly hard stone, these star holes are, as the title suggests, mysteriously created in the shape of stars. So far found within Massachusetts in the USA, and also within Volda in Norway, their existence, we feel, are proof of an ancient drilling technology, far superior to our own today, let alone our recent ancestors. How were these holes created, or indeed why? A number of these particular drill holes can be found within Volda, and a number have also been discovered within the surrounding area of Flint County Quarry, Massachusetts, although, interestingly, each slightly different in shape. Are these seemingly impossible drill holes evidence left by a lost civilization? Intriguingly, when the star holes occur, they only cover part of the total length of that particular hole, the remainder of the hole still having the typical round cylindrical shape. However, mysteriously, the length of the rifled grooves and their position within the hole varies considerably with each drill hole, sometimes even occurring midway through a rock. Ancient star holes, an as yet unexplained ancient feature, which we find highly compelling. My mission upon this channel is to provide details regarding ancient ruins, artifacts, and technologies that clearly demonstrate that there once existed lost, ancient, advanced civilizations that have been lost here upon our planet. My unwavering research dynamic is that said subject matter is crucially factual. Thus, it is always based upon that which I have personally sought to confirm as undeniable realities before sharing. I do not only offer an intellectual armory for you, the viewer, who is often confronted with many academic fallacies, but particularly the younger viewer, enabling their empowerment to correct academics, often ordered to pass on such fallacies through a permitted curriculum. As such, I feel that it is crucial that not only are the facts I share established proofs 
but that features which they explain away as others' work are established as beyond doubt as currently unexplainable, as such undeniable as the work of others. Exposing academia's lies due to our ancestors' limitations, ancestors often claimed as the constructors of said ruins found throughout the world. Due to this bestowed responsibility to only convey historical accuracies, established mystery, and ancestral limitations. Many independent researchers often privately contact me via my secure armored email, often sharing not only their own controversial research, sometimes including their own expedition details, but also academics in positions of tremendous public influence, who not only share my view that much of the history currently being taught to future generations is not only inaccurate, but is based upon a conspiracy of concealing past civilizations. One such email received recently pertained to something known as the moon shaft. However, although this is not the main theme of this particular video, I will briefly cover what has been shared with me, and after further research, endeavor to do a detailed video in the future regarding said explorations if enough evidence of its existence can be established. Sent to me by Mike Collins, a member of an unsuccessful expedition to try to rediscover this mysterious lair, a brief prologue is as follows, quote, Three soldiers hiding from the Germans in the Tatra Mountains in Slovakia discovered a lair which could possibly be the oldest man-made structure in the world. The structure is believed to be between 300 and 310 million years old by a number of individuals, with Heinrich Himmler even sending several scientific expeditions into the Tatra Mountains looking for the shaft, with members of the KGB also attempting to obtain the diary writings on the experience from these deceased soldiers. End quote. Although compelling, I am reluctant to cover this story yet due to a lack of any physical evidence, regardless of the considerable lengthy testimonies that pertain to its existence, I intend to invest some time in researching it further myself first. However, tonight's subject originates far away from the supposed moon shaft in China. Ancient star maps of such accuracy and range that due to currently attested academic understandings of the history they simply should not have possessed such knowledge, let alone been able to accurately illustrate it upon parchment, known as the Dunhua star chart. The chart is the first accurate graphical representation of star locations within ancient Chinese astronomy, and it is of nearly every star across the atlas. According to modern academia, it is dated to the Tang Dynasty between 618 and 907. Although I feel this is actually a copy of charts of a far earlier age, and thus of a far earlier, far more capable civilization. Before this map, much of the star information mentioned in historical Chinese texts was drastically inaccurate. However, this map provides a graphically precise verification of star observations and are part of a series of charts all known as the Dunhua manuscripts. It seems, however, in an attempt to quell the curiosity of the astute among us, considerable funding has been funneled into constructing an excuse for its existence. This funded project is known as the International Dunhua Project, with much of the research and indeed exclusive access to the maps solely granted to these academics, which I believe is an attempt to convolute their importance. However, regardless of these tremendous efforts, there are many features of the map which remain unexplainable. Compelling evidence of them being Chinese copies of knowledge left over by a past, vastly more advanced civilization, copies of elusive manuscripts that at some point within Chinese antiquity were most probably found preserved somewhere. First, the Dunhua star map is to date the world's oldest complete preserved star atlas meaning that before the ancient Chinese were even a seafaring civilization, they somehow had access to knowledge of the accurately plotted star charts of both hemispheres. Additionally, the main image, which many presume is the entire Dunhua star chart, an insinuation implied by Wikipedia, is only a small fraction of the collection. Yet this piece in itself is an exact, accurate plotting of polar constellations, 
And due to these ancient Chinese people being incapable of such tremendous voyages, not only does the advanced knowledge copied down upon these charts strongly support my posit of them being a rediscovered copied relic of a past civilization's knowledge. These copies were found in the early 1900s in a walled-up cave containing a cache of manuscripts. They were discovered by Chinese Taoist Wang Yuan Lu in a cave system known as the Mo Zhuao Caves. Although the scroll with the star chart was found amongst those documents by Oral Stein when he visited and examined the content of the cave in 1907. One of the first public mentionings of the script in Western studies was from Joseph Needham's 1959 version of the book Science and Civilization in China. Since that time, however, only a few publications have conveniently been devoted to the map, nearly all being Chinese publications. This map, or as we postulate, accurate copy, was made around the year 700. I feel their lack of public exposure and my reasoning for asserting that they were copies of a far more advanced civilization's work is not only due to the Chinese civilization's inability to travel to such locations to plot such charts at the time, but that the whole set of star maps contains over 1,300 stars, not only proving that although the Chinese are academically claimed to have believed the world was flat at the time, the star charts prove beyond doubt that they had knowledge of constellations from around the globe. The academic explanation for this is that although the Chinese supposedly presumed the world was flat, they somehow assumed that the heavens were somehow spherical, which to me just seems like a desperate attempt to discredit such manuscripts' true origins. I believe, due to the in-depth and accurate knowledge copied upon the star charts, much of which were far out of the reach of this ancient civilization's observational capabilities, be clear proof that they had discovered maps left by a civilization that was not only seafaring but global. Also, due to the chart featured on Wikipedia, had successfully explored the poles and accurately mapped its constellations. How did the ancient Chinese have such in-depth knowledge of so many constellations, especially polar constellations? We find such manuscripts, academia's funneling of considerable funding into the discrediting of their inexplicable nature and their lack of exposure as highly compelling. If you enjoy our content, if you think our battle worthy, please help us to continue our voyage of discovery in unraveling the mysteries of history. Links to donate can be found within the description. Without you, we cannot survive. Thank you.